Next question we often get asked is, uh, hey, if dinosaurs drowned in the flood, uh, have we found fresh dinosaur bones? Or are they all, if they're all fossilized, it takes millions of years, doesn't it? Well, first, it does not take millions of years for things to fossilize. We covered that on video number six. But yes, some fresh dinosaur bones have been found. There's a great book out called The Great Alaskan Dinosaur Adventure about some guys that went up to northern Alaska and uh, in the riverbanks up there in the Colville River on the north slope of Alaska found frozen dinosaur bones. I talked to Les Zerbe, my friend up there who's been a missionary for years in uh, Africa, I mean in Alaska. I was just up there a few months ago with him. He said he, he, he was there, he can drive right, fly his plane right to the spot, land there and dig out some fresh frozen dinosaur bones if we'd like. But yes, they have been found in uh, Journal Science Magazine in December of 93. They said, uh, report an amazing preservation of the bones of a young duckbill dinosaur found in Montana. Under a microscope, the fine structure of the bones was seen to have been preserved to such an extent that cell characteristics could be compared to cells of chicken bone. Anybody who teaches dinosaurs died millions of years ago has not studied the real evidence, okay? In northwestern Alaska, uh, in 1961, a geologist found a bed of dinosaur bones in unpermineralized, that's unfossilized condition. This is possibly the same bed that Les Zerbe goes to. He offered to take me last time I was there, but the weather wouldn't permit it. We were going to fly up there for a couple hours and see this stuff. I'll go next time I get up there. In Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, which is way on the north slope uh, near uh, Barrow, Alaska, they found frozen dinosaur bones. They're as light as balsa wood and look as fresh as yesterday's dog bones. The structure was porous and the fossils were not mineralized, not fossilized. A Canadian uh, Indian, Eskimo, in 1987 on Bylot Island up in northern Canada, found part of a lower jaw of a duckbill dinosaur. It was in fresh condition. Joe Taylor, our friend from uh, Crosbyton, Texas, has a website, mountblanco.com. He has dug up dinosaur bones before that are not fossilized. He's dug up dinosaurs all over the world. But uh, in uh, the summer of 2005, they found dinosaur tissue inside a T-Rex leg bone, and the dinosaur tissue was still soft. Now, the scientists are trying to figure out, like John Horner from Montana is trying to figure out how could fossil, how could they stay soft for 70 million years? The thought will never cross his mind that maybe they're not 70 million years old. Okay, he's already committed to that. And to say maybe they're only 6,000 years old or 4,400 years old from the flood would absolutely be anathema to them. They'll never consider that. So now they're going to probably get a government grant and try to figure out how could they stay soft for 70 million years. They're totally asking the wrong question. The question is when they formed, not how they formed. Here's a picture from a magazine showing they found a fossilized dinosaur, still had what they thought, and I, I believe was con confirmed, was the heart, soft tissue, fossilized in a dinosaur. Up in Alaska, they frequently find dinosaurs. Well, Alaska's cold. Reptiles don't do well in cold weather. But dinosaurs in Alaska? Not many, but a few have been found. And yes, it's true, some have been found that are not fossilized. You can uh, do more research on that on your own. We'll cover more on our college class uh, when we get to that. If there really was a flood, I often get the question, well, where were there, where's all the humans? Why aren't there more human bones? There should be, you know, bazillions of human bones buried. I mean, we find lots of clams, find lots of other animals. And it's true, of all the fossils formed, Jonathan, I don't know if you know the percentage. It's like 90% of all the fossils formed are marine organisms. Have you read something like that? And 90 or 98. 90 or 98, you know, animals that live in the water, okay. Very few mammal fossils are found and very few, you know, uh, human fossils are found. Marvin Lubinow, in his book, Bones of Contention, it's the best one I'm aware of on the topic. He's a creationist, but he spent years and years and years, like 25 years, studying all the human remain bones, human remains. He says there are about 4,000 human remains have been found. Now, and it's compared to clams, you know, we find billions of those, or fish, we find billions of those. Why only 4,000? Well, there's a couple of things to consider. Why so few human bones are found? And by the way, they're all 100% human. Actually, the Neanderthals had thicker bones than we have. They were in much better condition. They were like, they say the average Neanderthal could pick up a football player and fling him over the goalpost. I mean, they were just incredible condition. The muscular uh, structure must have been great. But when God made the world 6,000 years ago, there were two people, but it was full of plants and full of animals. 4,400 years later, it was still full of plants and full of animals and still not full of people. I have no idea what the population was at the time of the flood. This is just a pure guess with probably a billion people. If you figure they're living 900 years and having 70 or 80 kids per family, uh, you know, that's what you need, Tanya, about 70 kids, right? Uh, it would be a large population in a hurry. But let's just pick a number and say there was a billion. Why are so few found as fossils? Well, 
The purpose of the flood, according to Genesis, was to destroy man off the earth. That's why God did the flood. The Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days, and there were mighty men of old. So, I don't know for sure what that means, but I suspect that might mean the people were actually bigger before the flood came. We've covered on video two about some of the giant fossil skeletons that have been found. People nine feet tall, ten feet tall, twelve feet tall. I don't know if everybody was that big or not, but certainly it appears some of them were. So there are several the theories of why so, human, so few human bones have been found. Number one, there were less people to be killed. There aren't as many people available. So you're not going to find as many bones of them. Okay? You're going to find more animals and more fish and clams and stuff like that. Secondly, people are smarter than animals. Well, some people. And they would tend to avoid drowning until the last possible minute. Whereas animals would get surprised and covered up and buried, the humans would figure out some way to avoid this. Plus, it probably took about six months to kill everybody. I mean, the flood covered the world, but it doesn't mean it covered the whole world instantly. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. And probably what we see today, the continental shapes and everything, obviously is a pure coincidence based on the water level. And everything was flexing up and down during the flood we covered on video 6. So, if the earth was totally different, different, different configurations, unrecognizable by today's globe, but as the crust of the earth is flex, flexing up and down, the water is slowly coming up from the fountains of the deep that are broken open. <clears throat> the rain was 40 days, but the water kept coming up for 150 days. So if we start with the assumption that during the flood there were uh, high ground above water may have lasted for six months. The high ground getting smaller and smaller, and people would run to high ground, and they also have the tide. The moon is causing the tide. The moon doesn't know or care that there's a flood on the earth. It's just, you know, pulling the water up. So the tide may go up, cover an area, and then go down, and people and animals would run to the new, newly exposed island. You know, ah, oh, here's high ground. Get over there. So we'd find footprints in these mud, mud layers, that then would get covered up with the next tide. I mean, every six and a half hours, the tide changes. High tide to low tide, six hours and 25 minutes average. So as these mud layers are full of footprints, they bake in the sun just for a couple hours, enough to get a skin on them, and then a new mud layer washes in on top from the next tide. It is highly probable that during this flood, during these first few months of the flood, you would get thousands of layers deposited for multiple reasons, we cover on video six, and you may have footprints within each of these layers. We had a guy called into the radio program yesterday, uh, the guy from Sweden that calls in once in a while, you know, to our radio program, evolutionist. He says, well, we find layers of rock and footprints between the layers. He said, that proves each layer was exposed for thousands of years. No, that proves it was exposed for maybe 30 minutes. <laughs> Not proof, doesn't prove it's exposed for thousands of years. So yes, it's possible to get footprints, and especially if you look at all the, nearly all the footprints are running the same direction. What would that mean? They're trying to avoid something. They're all going the same way. Probably avoiding the flood water. And in Psalm 104, it says, The mountains arose, the valleys sank down. So during the flood, the crust of the earth was all broken up into plates. And they're much more flexible and movable than they are today. Today they're kind of locked into position as most of the water is gone that was underneath that was lubricating this movement. So they could run to high ground and then of course a couple days later that may not be high ground. Something else becomes high ground as the plates twist around. So second reason though, people are smarter and probably would avoid drowning. If they end up on top, they don't rot. I mean they rot, they don't fossilize. How many buffalo got killed out west in the last 200 years? Like millions? None of them fossilized. See, things only fossilize if they're buried. So you could have a lot of humans get killed toward the end of the flood, or toward the middle of the flood, I guess, and not be fossilized at all. Thirdly, if humans were bigger, they would not be recognized as human. I mean, if you find a five-foot thigh bone, you're not going to recognize it as a human. You're going to say, oh, it must be from a, you know, a dinosaur cave bay or something. So those are the reasons why so few human fossils have been found. Fourthly, I'm not sure who's doing the counting. When they say 4,000 have been found, uh, who's counting all these? Marvin Lubinow says that's what he can find in the, in the published record. But how many things have been found that are human, fossilized, in certain layers, but it doesn't match the established scientific paradigm of the day? And so they say, we better not even report this. Because you're not allowed to find humans with dinosaurs or else, man, you're going to lose your job. You can't go against the evolution theory. It's a carefully protected state religion. I point out, no human and chicken bones have been fossil, found fossilized together in the same rock strata anywhere in the world. So that proves humans and chickens did not live at the same time. No. 
you know that's not good logic, okay? We don't have to find the bones together to prove they live together. We don't have to find the footprints, to, footprints together to prove anything either. No human and chicken footprints have ever been found together. No coelacanth fossils were found for 65 million years of their geologic column. They've got their geologic column and they say, oh, coelacanths lived 65 million years ago. How do you know? Well, that's the last fossil we found of them. And then they find them still alive. What does that prove? For 65 million years, by their thinking, no coelacanths lived or no coelacanths fossilized. Obviously, they would say none, it just happened that none fossilized. Well, it could be that none of the humans fossilized either that were buried uh, or weren't buried deep enough or they haven't been found yet. All kinds of reasons for that. I was in a debate uh, with a former preacher turned atheist one time, the debate over Noah's Ark. One of his arguments was that Noah could not have built the ark like the Bible says because the Bible says Noah covered the ark with pitch. And he said, Hoven, don't you know pitch is made from oil and oil is a post-flood product according to your theory. The flood buried this world. All these animals got buried and squished and turned to oil. So if oil came as a result of the flood, then how could Noah have pitch to cover the ark? Well, that's based on a common misunderstanding. In Genesis 6, it says, Noah covered the ark with pitch within and without. Make it with pitch, Exodus 2. Noah, or Moses, was put in a little basket covered with pitch. So what is pitch? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 34, uh, the streams thereof shall be turned to pitch, the dust to brimstone, and the land to, shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. Pitch, according to the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, which is in the library there, pitch is made from tree sap. There used to be huge industries taking pine trees, baking them down, getting the sap out, and making pitch just for waterproofing ships. Kind of like varnish today, or spar varnish, or... Uh, uh, linseed oil. There are many oils and things made that don't have to be, rely on something from a flood. It doesn't have to be something that was destroyed in the flood. Pitch, according to the dictionary, the, residue, the resin of pine or turpentine. And there were giant factories all over America producing barrels and barrels of pitch to sell to ships in the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s. It was common. You bring a few extra barrels of pitch with you. If you get a leak in your ship, you, you tar it. So it does not have to be from uh, flood-related deposits. I'm holding in my hand, I don't know if you guys can focus in on that or not, this is a piece of slate, or shale, I mean. There are <clears throat> probably 60 layers to it, real thin layers, and you can see oil oozing out the side. But right there on the surface is an exact, it's a fish. It's true that animals under pressure turn to oil. It's a fact. This fish was squeezed between these layers and it's, you can see the actual impression of the fish. There's no question that at least some of the oil in the ground comes from organisms, living organisms, fish, you know, people, whatever, that are squeezed. But that doesn't mean Noah had to have this kind of oil to waterproof the ark. Right? This is on our Creation Evidence Museum if you want to come down to Dinosaur Adventure Land, you can take a look at that. Next question. I often get asked the question, is modern man smart and ancient man stupid? You know, was he stupid or was ancient man uh, really smart? There's a good book called The Puzzle of Ancient Man by Don Chittick. Excellent book. I believe they've had a hard time keeping it in print. Uh, we, have a, we sell a lot of them, I know. It's really, really good. Going through all kinds of interesting artifacts that are found about humans, but made by humans, amazing machines and stuff that would have to be really, really old. Well, the Bible teaches before the flood came, the people lived to be 900 years old. Adam came pre-programmed straight from the hand of God. He could walk, talk, name the animals, and get married first day. He probably knew incredible amounts of information that was pre-programmed in, or after spending 100 years walking and talking with God, he just knew a lot of stuff that God told him. God would say, Adam, you see this tree right here? Watch this. You pull off the bark, scrape the inside, and chew on that. And, oh, wow. Yeah, it's got vitamins. You need that, Adam. Probably a lot of the ancient medicines, you know, that cultures have, are remnants of things left over from knowledge passed down by the ancients. Like how did the first guy know you can take a willow tree and scrape the bark off and make vitamin C out of the tea? I mean, how do they know that? <laughs> Who's the first guy to start chewing on a tree? I mean, you got to wonder. Somebody must have told him. So if they're living 900 years and having huge families and learning an incredible amount, I don't know how far advanced they got before the flood came, but I suspect possibly even more advanced than we are today. And some people say, well, why don't we dig up, the, dig up their cities? Well, the problem is we're looking at what things that we need today 
and assuming that they needed them before the flood. Suppose they lived in a world with perfect weather. You don't need a house. Just go sleep on the grass. Ever, suppose you lived in a world where none of the animals would harm you. All the animals were friendly. Everything's vegetarian, Genesis 1.29. Again, you don't need a house. And why don't we find their cars? Well, man, if you're 9 or 10 or 12 feet tall and can run 50 miles an hour, and you, everything's growing in your yard, you don't need to go anywhere anyway. <laughs> why do you need a highway system? Why do you need a car? You don't need airplanes. You don't need trains. So if you can think Garden of Eden conditions, the things that they needed would not be the same things that we need. After the flood, the people were still living to be 400 years old. So a lot of this knowledge would be retained. Now today, you know, about the time you know everything, you're 80 years old and you die. <laughs> now you can't pass it on to anybody else. But if you could live to be four or 500, you could pass on your knowledge to your great, 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 great grandchild. So it would just be a real, real different world back then. So a lot of this knowledge, I think, went to the grave. But in the old days, you could go talk to your great, 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 great grandfather and get advice. And he'd give you some really cool advice on how to do certain things. Many civilizations after the flood would arise very quickly. If you got a bunch of smart people, Noah's sons, having, you know, 15, 20 kids per family or whatever, and they're going to go off to this area and they're going to build their own civilization. Well, it wouldn't take them long as long as they've got high IQ. They might not have all the technology. They might have to make stone tools at first, you know, until they can dig a hole to find the iron to melt it down to get, make the steel tools. They would know how to do it. It's kind of a Gilligan's Island situation. But within 50 years, you could build a civilization. You look at Robinson Crusoe, you know, lands on an island. So after 20 years, he's got a whole, <clears throat> got a farm, got a house, got a, a fort, did it all himself, you know. So yeah, it doesn't, especially you get smart people in situations like that, it, you can build a civilization in a hurry. It's interesting, if you study history, all of the ancient civilizations, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Greeks, they all are the Chinese, they just arose out of nowhere. Poof, there's a civilization. There is no evidence of this stuff they teach in school, of them going from hunters and gatherers and grunts and groans, you know, caveman stuff, becoming civilized and building cities. There's no evidence of that. It's, the farther back you go, it's all of a sudden, poof, there's the beginning of the Egyptian civilization, the beginning of the Chinese civilization, just like they moved in and built it in less than 100 years. So some strange things have been found in the fossils, uh, as in the ground, that would indicate man used to be really smart. This little airplane, for instance, is in the Smithsonian, I believe. Right, yeah, in Smithsonian. It was found in a grave in Columbia. <clears throat> it's about a thousand years old. But it's an airplane, quite obviously, with all the features of an airplane. But it can't be an airplane, according to the evolutionist. So therefore, they have it labelized in the Smithsonian as a stylized insect. Now tell me, does that look like a stylized insect to you? <laughs> See, they can't admit that ancient man knew about airplanes because that would go against the theory. The theory says modern man is smart, ancient man was stupid, he was, you know, a chimpanzee walking on four most of the time, slowly came up and here we are today, the gods of the universe. That's the thinking in their mind. Actually, the evidence shows the opposite of that. Here's an airplane, again, found in an Egyptian tomb this time, 2100 years old, pre-Christ. How did they know about airplanes? a little model airplane. They knew about flight. This iron pot, we've got a model of it here, was found inside a lump of coal. This is a replica. You can get a replica from Carl Baugh. They're breaking open a lump of coal and there's an iron pot inside. They examine the coal that comes out and it's molded right to the pot on both sides. I mean the coal formed around the iron pot. What would you conclude? That a coal miner dropped it? No, because then the coal won't be conformed to the pot. I would conclude that they had iron and were making iron vessels before the flood. During the flood, they got buried in a forest of trees and squished and turned to coal, and of course it's not going to affect the iron any. How do you get an iron pot and lump of coal? Ancient man must have been smart, not primitive. In Peru, they've got giant stone walls like the one in the picture here. These stone walls are phenomenal. Some of the rocks in there are so huge, we can't even move them today. There's a, more in the Puzzle of Ancient Man about that topic if you want to read more. But uh, there's One of the stones down in Peru weighs 20,000 tons. Now to give you an idea how big that is, the largest crane on earth today can lift 3,000 tons. I think they just built one in Japan, uh, if I recall, for unloading ships. I just heard about it in 2003 or 2004 that can lift 6,000 tons. 
The something like that. That may be the new, somebody's going to say, oh, Hovind, you're wrong. It's more, 3,000 is wrong. You're lying. I'm not lying. I just don't know. I think it's 6,000 tons now, okay? But still, he's got stones up here that weigh 20,000 tons. How did they move that? Who, who, who did it and how did they do it? I don't think it's logical to say ancient man was primitive. They must have known something we don't know today. Like uh, this guy said, what is truly impossible about the block is that the size of a, it's the size of a five-story house and weighs 20,000 tons. We have no combination of machinery today that could dislodge such a weight, let alone move it. We can't even break it loose from the ground, let alone move it. We can't do it. This bell was found inside a lump of coal in West Virginia. The guy who had it on his desk for years later moved to central Florida, and I've not been able to, he's an old man now, I've not been able to get a hold of him lately, so if you get his address, let me know. Because I think he needs to have that on display at a creation museum in Pensacola, Florida. That's what I think. This thing was analyzed, and they said, well, this is some kind of strange uh, old, uh, like a Buddhist-type god on top of here. But how could you find a brass bell inside coal? Ancient man knew how to work with all the metals. Bible says Tubal-Cain was an artificer in brass and iron. That's Adam's grandson. They were already working with brass and iron. This is a little zinc and silver vessel was found inside rock, supposed to be 600 million years old. Well, I disagree with the 600 million year part, but they knew about things. There's a great article in the Puzzle of Ancient Man about the uh, little device found in a ship that was su sunk in 100 B.C. in the Aegean Sea, which is right next to Greece. Okay? It's got an analog computer on board. How on earth did they know about analog computers in 100 B.C.? It's called the uh, Antic Antikythera device, Antikythera mechanism. The History Channel uh, in March of 2005 was amazing. It had a whole hour-long message about this Antikythera device found in Greece. They actually built a working model of it and said this thing, by turning the crank, would be able to predict where the planets would be or the sun would be. It would be like an amazing computer for ships navigating. 100 B.C. No, ancient man was not primitive. You can get copies of this hammer from our uh, museum. This uh, Dr. Baugh has the original in his museum. He lets us make replicas of it. This was found in 1934 in uh, Texas, New London, Texas. When they first found the hammer, the handle was petrified, what was left of it. And they looked at the hammer and said, man, it was in solid rock. I said, what on earth? How can a hammer be in rock? And the rock was supposed to be 400 million years old. So, of course, guys that, who believe in evolution would say, well, that just proves aliens visited the planet 400 million years ago and one of them dropped his hammer. I mean, that's the kind of logic they, they use. Instead of thinking, you know, maybe our whole time scale's wrong, they will never consider that. They cut a little notch in the hammer with a file in 1934 to see what kind of metal it was. It is still not rusted, the notch. It's a type of a stainless steel. Battelle Laboratory analyzed it and said it's 96% iron, 2.6% chlorine, and three-quarter percent sulfur. And then they said, you know, we don't think you can get those elements to combine unless you do it under a much stronger magnetic field. Probably the pre-flood Earth had a magnetic field eight or ten times stronger than what we have today. This was found in Iraq. This is a little battery. Quite a few of these were found. They knew about electricity 2,000 years ago. The Egyptians apparently knew about electricity. Here's a hieroglyphic showing snakes in some kind of chamber hooked with a wire going to a little generator of some kind. We don't know. There are two theories. One is they are using electricity to mummify the snake or do something, or they're using electric eels to produce the electricity. I don't know which way the electricity is going, or even if it's electricity. But I think <clears throat> we've got the wrong idea to say modern man is smart and ancient man was stupid. I think ancient man knew a lot. They knew about brain surgery. Quite a few skulls are found like this. This process is called a trepanning. They would actually cut into somebody's head, and many are found with the hole healed over, which indicates the patient lived. Okay? I mean, cutting a hole in the head is no big deal. But some of the Ica stones from Peru show what appears to be brain surgery. Dr. Dennis Swift, that spoke at our boot camp in 2004, has uh, some of the instruments, the co hardened copper instruments that they would use for brain surgery or for surgery, period. Okay? Qu ancient man knew how to do all kinds of things with people's heads besides cut them open and let them heal. They did made strange shapes to the heads. They apparently did heart surgery, from some of the Ica stones anyway. It appears that they're doing you know, open heart surgery. Here's a guy with an artificial limb attached, so they knew about that. 
That would have been, you know, 2,000 years ago. This little machine appears to be some kind of steam engine. They might have known about some kind of power like that 2,000 years ago. They certainly knew about the wheel. This little cat was found on uh, wheels to move around, a little kid's toy apparently, in some of the Inca Indian tombs. They knew certainly were smart as far as biology goes. This little spider is one of the uh, little nothing, it's 150 feet tall. It's one of the Nazca line images. We cover some of that on uh, video too, but they knew that to make this spider with no eyes because it's blind, these little spiders are extremely rare. It's only an eighth of an inch long and it lives in caves in the dark in the Amazon a thousand miles away from where the drawing is. So they really knew about their biology and they knew to make the one leg longer and it's the correct leg too. Third leg down on the right on the right side. That leg during mating season for 15 seconds that one leg grows longer and it changes DNA off the tip of that leg. And they knew that. So they were not ancient, uh, not stupid. They were ancient but they were not stupid. This uh, Pira Reese map of 1513 shows Antarctica with no ice on it. How did they know to, first of all, how did they find Antarctica? How did they know to map it with no ice? Something was different, okay? This metallic sphere was found in South Africa. It has three parallel grooves around the equator, but it was found in what they said was pre Cambrian material, 2.8 billion years old. Well, of course, I disagree with the 2.8 billion years. It's a human artifact, quite obviously, found in rock, supposed to be 2.8 billion years old. But see, rather than question, you know, maybe it's not 2 billion years old. Guys like Michael Cremo, who wrote the great book on stuff like this, they're called OOPART, Out of Place Artifacts, O-O-P-A-R-T. He studies all kinds of these things. Now, he's a Hindu. Michael Cremo has the book Hidden History of the Human Race. He says this proves Aliens came and visited the earth 2.8 billion years ago. Rather than question, hey, hey, wait, maybe the whole geologic column is wrong, they just, I don't know why, they're not allowed to question that. His book's called The Hidden History of the Human Race. It's in our library if you want to read that. Here's a mortar and pestle, you know, to grind wheat or grind flour with, grind corn. The problem is, it's in rock supposed to be 33 to 55 million years old, way before man got here. So what do you conclude? Well, again, aliens came visited the planet. These little uh, spirals were found. The thing that's amazing about these little spirals, they're made of tungsten. Very difficult metal to work with, very difficult to refine, and these things are three ten thousandths of an inch, three ten thousandths of a millimeter in diameter, and it follows the perfect golden mean ratio. Same thing used in the Fibonacci sequence, 1 to 1.618. How do they know about that? A lot of these are found in Russia. Pavel, if you get over there, get, bring me some of these. I want some of these for the museum, these little amazing little spirals. There's all kinds of stuff on the internet about that if you want to read it. Well, what about the pyramid? Who built the Great Pyramid? If we think an ancient man is, you know, dumb, how did they build the Big Pyramid? There are 66 copies of the original, apparently. There appear to be 67 of these giant stone pyramids found around the world. Who built them and why? Well, there's not much question on the 66 copies, you know, who built them. It was the Egyptians or the, you know, South American Mayan Indians or something. But who built that original one? The original pyramid is often called the Great Pyramid. It is by far the largest of the pyramids, and it's very different in that there are no inscriptions found in it, other than a few marks the builders apparently made, you know, put this rock on top of this one. But all the rest of the pyramids in Egypt have all kinds of hieroglyphics, you know, this is King Herman, the greatest guy that ever lived, blah, blah, blah. Not this one. The greatest pyramid, the biggest building on earth by far, has no inscriptions. Who built it? Why was it built? Well, there are four theories about the Great Pyramid, and they fall into two general categories. One theory says it was built before the flood by some godly people, i.e. Adam, Enoch maybe, I don't know, and it, the purpose of it was to preserve some ancient knowledge, because there are some amazing mathematical formulas in the pyramid. Like, you know, twice the height divided by the base is the value of pi, 3.14159, I forget. There's all kinds of amazing mathematics in the Great Pyramid. So one theory says it was built by godly people before the flood. Second theory says it's built by heathen before the flood. It's just a heathen structure, some kind of temple worship or something. The third theory says it's built by godly people after the flood. And the fourth one says it's built by heathen after the flood. Probably it was not built during the flood. I think we could probably all agree on that, okay? Not a good time to build a pyramid. I kind of lean toward number one, 
but I, I don't, wouldn't prove that. I couldn't prove it and wouldn't be dogmatic about it. I think some godly people, probably Enoch, built this pyramid to preserve the gospel story. One of the theories on all this is, of course, Adam, Adam did not have a Bible. So God gave him the gospel story in the stars. This is what many people think, and I kind of lean that way, but though I'm, I'm willing to discuss it. Noah did not have a Bible. And if the canopy was gone that used to protect them and probably amplified the light so they could see the stars better before the flood, you know, 20 inches or 30 inches of ice, compacted, super frozen, like we talked about on video two, that canopy before the flood would have actually made it easier to see the stars and they could actually hear the music of the stars, the zodiac, that's one of the theories. But Noah didn't have a Bible. He had a couple chapters because Adam actually wrote part of Genesis. Okay, we cover that in the Teledos coming up here soon. But so God gave them the gospel in stone. This is how the, it preaches good, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But basically there used to be the gospel in stars, then there was the gospel in stone, and today we have the gospel in scripture. The three different ways. Now that, I, let's assume that there may be some truth to that and go from there. If there isn't, it's not a big deal. I won't lose any sleep over it. But the Great Pyramid is an amazing structure. By far the largest building on the planet today. Still, largest building in the world. Uh, built bigger than anything ever built by man since. Some people think the Isaiah 19:19 passage is referring to the pyramid. It says, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a border, a pillar at the border thereof. And it shall be for a sign and a witness. There are quite a few folks who think that the pyramid is this, this is it. Because that there's, the teaching goes, that Egypt split into two kingdoms, northern and southern kingdom, and they were fighting in you know, civil war kind of stuff, and this pyramid is right on the border. And then when they united, it's now in the midst thereof. So it is both at the border and in the midst. Otherwise, how could a building be that way? Now, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses have gone crazy with the pyramid. There are all kinds of books by Jehovah's Witnesses thinking, oh, this prophesies everything and proves Jehovah's Witnesses are right, you know. And they, they kind of take it to real wild extremes. And there are many books available on the pyramid, some of which are absolutely loony. But it's very interesting reading. The pyramid is a huge building. The, it goes up four sides to the, stop, to the top, and the top stone was never installed. If you look at the diagram here, there's only one door into the pyramid. Nobody could find the door until 800 A.D. That pyramid sat there for thousands of years, and nobody could find their way in. Finally, in 800 A.D., some Arabs got a hammer and chisel and just started pounding a hole, chiseled their way into the pyramid. They chiseled and chiseled and for months, and the guy kept telling his workers, oh, there's going to be lots of gold in here, you're all going to be rich, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, finally, after months and months of chiseling, everybody's getting tired of going in, you know, digging a hole in the rock, okay, because it was solid rock. Finally, they were close to giving up, and they heard a noise of a rock falling. And he said, oh, it came from over that way. Let's chisel there. They chiseled over, and they hit one of the passages in the middle, and then had to work their way backwards to find the door. Had they known where it was, it could have walked up and just pushed it right open. But nobody could find this door for centuries. Well, once they found the pyramid and mapped it out, you see it's got an entrance where the A is. The entrance, only one entrance in, it immediately takes you on the broad road down to the pit, letter C. Or you can take a choice to make a turn and go up uh, channel E there, up the narrow road that goes to the king's chamber. So your choice is the broad way that leads to the pit or the narrow way that leads to the king's chamber. Now that'll preach. It sounds like there's a little gospel in there somewhere, right? If you get to the king's chamber, you find yourself in an empty tomb where nobody ever rotted, no bodies de decomposed in there, and it's on the 50th row of stones. What's that all mean? I don't know. There's a grand gallery that some people think has marks along the way that in those marks, if they go by pyramid inches, which is a little bigger than our inch, the pyramid inch, they say you, each one marks a year, and they, they say on this grand gallery, that it's got marked off where World War I is, World War II, major events through world history are supposedly marked off in the Grand Gallery. That's some of the stuff you read in these books when you read about the pyramid. It's the largest building by far. It contains enough stone to build a 10-foot high brick wall all the way around Texas, or France, they're about the same size. 10-foot high brick wall around Texas. The top of the pyramid is 455 feet high. The, the 50th row of stones, which is interesting, the 50th year jubilee, the 50th row of stones is where the king's chamber is. 
And those who teach that the pyramid has Christian symbolism, of course, will jump on this type of thing, the broad way, the narrow way, you know, the king's chamber, etc. Um, or you go down to the pit. In the king's chamber is an empty tomb. I was told, I didn't check it out, maybe, I'm not, maybe it's not correct, but it has the same volume, this empty tomb, as the Ark of the Covenant. You take the length times the width times the height, it equals the volume of the Ark of the Covenant. Maybe somebody can check it out, let me know if that's correct. But originally, the pyramid was covered by 144,000 smooth, polished casing stones. Each one weighed about, I believe they said 10 tons were the casing stones. They fit together so tightly, in many cases you couldn't even find the seam. And in all cases, I was told, you can't even get a piece of paper between them. These, imagine a 10-ton stone fitting together with the next one so tightly, you can't even get paper between it. No mortar. I mean, today we build brick walls and put mortar in there, and you can look at the brick on the house here, and some of them are straight and some of them are not too straight. You know, the brick layers get in a little bit of a hurry. These stones are massive, and they didn't even use mortar, and they fit together flawlessly. And the top stone was never in installed. And those who teach it's a Christian building or Christian principles in there say 144,000, uh-huh, Revelation chapter 7, 144,000. The Bible talks about the whole body fitly joined together. And they'll say, see, this is evidence that it has some Christian symbolism. And maybe it does, I don't know. Right? Ephesians chapter 4, the whole body fitly joined together. Matthew 21 talks about the stone that the builders rejected. Now, the Great Pyramid never did have a chief cornerstone. Imagine the largest, neatest building on the planet, no cornerstone. Why would they stop one rock short? Why didn't they finish the job? Well, I don't know. There are a couple of theories about that. But in Mark 12, it talks about the scripture. Scripture says, the stone that the builders rejected. Luke 20, the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is obviously referring to Jesus Christ. In Daniel, it tells about the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands and smote the image on the feet in the book of Daniel. Could this stone be Jesus Christ, who's going to make his own kingdom on the world? Revelation 21 talks about the New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. There are those who teach that the New Jerusalem, the city, and the Bible tells us the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven, will be clear as crystal, four square, and 12,000 furlongs. That's 1,379 miles. So there's going to be a city in Revelation 21 that is 1,300 or 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles. And everybody assumes it's going to be a cube. Maybe so, I don't know. But maybe it's a pyramid. Because that's a structure that could also have those dimensions and it would lie four square. And if it's a pyramid, pyramids only have one cornerstone right on top. Whereas other buildings would have four. So there are those who teach that the Great Pyramid is going, the, the New Jerusalem is going to be in the shape of a Great Pyramid and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone and He is the light of the world. And if the whole thing's clear as crystal, then the light just kind of translucent, uh, translucent. The light goes right through. So He is the light thereof. The first uh, 13 verses in the Bible starts off with this, the world has light, but it has no sun. The last 26 verses of the Bible, the world has light, but it has no sun. He is the light thereof. And so maybe the pyramid is symbolic of that. I don't know. Noah Hutchins got a good book on that if you want to read it. And of course, if the, any of this is true, it's obvious Satan would use this as a, you know, perverted for his use. And the Great Pyramid on the back of your dollar bill is a Masonic Lodge symbol, which has 13 rows of stones representing the 13 degrees in the Blue Lodge. The chief cornerstone is not yet in place. And many people say this represents Lucifer and he's going to come down and establish his kingdom when actually, you know, God's going to establish his kingdom toward the end. But which one's right? I don't know. I kind of lead toward number one, but I wouldn't be dogmatic. The Bible isn't clear. Next question. <clears throat> the textbooks often teach the earth was a hot molten mass. This earth science book says, as the earth formed, it was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. Well, now the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So, was the earth a hot molten mass and it slowly cooled down over billions of years or was it created under water, which means, of course, it has to be less than 212 degrees. It's not a hot molten mass. Somebody's wrong. Either the Bible is wrong or the textbooks are wrong about the earth being, you know, hot molten mass. So what is the evidence? What's the truth about this? One of the neatest books on this topic is this one we referred to earlier by Robert Gentry called Creation's Tiny Mystery. He spent years studying radiopolonium halos, which are little tiny rings. They are only visible with a microscope. And they're found in granites. Every type of granite all over the world contains these little radiopolonium halos, little tiny circles in the rock. Well, what are they? Well, polonium is one of the many elements on the periodic table. 
As polonium decays, it's radioactive, it's dropping to another level, it sends off little fragments, kind of like a hand grenade. The problem is polonium has a really, really short half-life, like 164 thousandths of a second. So if this was taking place in hot molten rock, it would decay, the polonium would decay, poof, make its little halo, and the rock is liquid so it would disappear, it would flow away. Just like the fireworks from the 4th of July don't stay there in the sky all year. It goes up, poof, makes a little ring, and then falls down. But if you could explode a hand grenade in a giant block of jello, the fragments would go out and stick and be preserved. The only way you could preserve a ring, a halo, would be to do it in something that is, you know, like a giant block of jello or in a already, something already solid. The way to get these little polonium halos preserved, which are found all over the world, is to do it while the rock is already solid. Robert Gentry was writing all kinds of articles about this radio polonium halo saying, look, you know, this indicates the earth was never hot molten rock. And granite is an interesting rock. I don't think anybody knows for sure how granite formed. If you melt granite and then let it cool down, it does not turn back to granite. It turns to rhyolite. You can see a picture of rhyolite here. So all the granites have these polonium halos. What does that mean? Apparently granite was the original created foundation stone. That was the original created rock. It's the only way to get these little halos in there that I know. You can talk to Robert Gentry. His website is halos.com and get much more of the technical information on this. So I think the evidence would point to the fact the earth was never hot molten rock. And then, uh, NOVA TV program, they ran an article in the oh, summer of 05, they said, Oxygen 18 found in 4.4 billion year old zircons show it had contact with large quantities of water. Why don't they get it? If these little zircon crystals, which are extremely tiny, have evidence, show, show us that they had qu contact with large quantities of water, 4.4 billion years old, I don't buy that of course for a second, but their own evidence ought to show them the earth was never a hot molten mass. Never. Often in seminars I get asked the question, what about global warming? Is the earth really getting hotter? Well, I don't know. I've lived on it for 53 years now, but it's, to me it seems about the same as it's always been. But of course that's a short time frame compared to the big picture. According to the First Corinthians, it says the earth is the Lord's. God owns the world. He, psalmist said, Psalm 8, when I consider the heavens, God made the heavens, and thou, he made man to have dominion over them. Our job is to be the, the tenant. God's the owner, he's the landlord, we're the tenant. Our job is to take care of his earth. It doesn't belong to us, but we're supposed to take care of it. It belongs to him. Now Karl Marx in his Communist Manifesto gave ten ways to destroy a, a capitalist country and turn it into a communist country. Number one was abolish private property. That was essential to destroy capitalism. Nobody's allowed to have private property. Well, if you read through the Bible in Leviticus 25, <clears throat> it talks about in the 50th year they have the year of Jubilee. You proclaim liberty throughout the land and everybody returns to his possession. There's a good link here between liberty and having your own possessions. See, if you own it, you control it. So if God created the world, he owns it, he controls it, and he's let man use it for his glory. And there are those who don't like that idea, guys like Karl Marx and communists, they think, no, the world belongs to us, you know, and we control it, there is no God. But in 1 Kings it talks about having your own vine, your own fig tree, drink water out of your own cistern, living, running waters out of your own well. Private property is essential to liberty. And Peter Burrell said, we reject the idea of private property. Kids in school today are having pledges like this, talk about stupid, this kind of stuff's on the walls of many public schools. I pledge allegiance to the earth, which I do love and depend on, and to all life on land, air, and sea, which is as much a part of earth as me. This one says, I pledge allegiance to the world, to care for earth, sea, and air, to honor every living thing with peace and justice everywhere. Jacob Redstead told me a couple years ago, he said when he was in third grade in elementary school in Minnesota, his teacher, Miss Klopaki, took down the American flag and had the third graders pledge to the earth instead. Can you imagine? Boys and girls, we're going to pledge to the world today. We're starting these kids in third grade. Half the cartoons on Saturday morning TV now are that kind of way, you know. Destroy the mean old capitalists, you know, that are destroying the world and save the planet, you know, Captain Planet. There's all kinds of cartoons designed to get the kids thinking that, you know, we got to save the earth. Well, I am against pollution and I'm against destroying things unnecessarily, okay. But 
The real purpose of this environmental movement and the big scare about global warming is not to save the earth. The purpose is to establish communist plank number one, abolish private property. They want you to have to get a permit to cut down a tree on your own property. One guy in California had this tree was growing, obviously, into his house. And it was crushing the front porch. The house was a hundred and some years old. And it had been planted and the tree was growing and was caving in the front porch. So he went to get a permit to cut down the tree. And they said, you can't cut down the tree because, you know, the trees are protected. He said, well, then I need to get a permit to remodel my porch. They said, no, that's a house is 100 years old. That's a historic building. You can't remodel the porch. <laughs> Talk about stupid. Why go ask for a permit at all? That's what starts the problem. But see, once people sign a contract to become a servant of whoever, now you're under contractual law. You know, if you sign a contract to become 501c3, well, then you better do everything they tell you to do, okay? So don't sign the contract. Don't get yourself tangled up in those things. And that gets difficult to do. But there's a good book on the global warming question if you want to read more. It's called Facts, Not Fear. I'm sure it's available lots of places, but uh, Marilyn Quayle, Dan Quayle's wife, the former vice president, wrote the foreword to it. What is the real evidence <clears throat> about global warming? And you can take a look through that if you'd like. It's in our library or order your own if you'd like. They said in a, a magazine that man-made rainforest baffles scientists. They said, a man-made rainforest that should have taken millennia to evolve has baffled scientists by springing up in just 150 years. This business of us destroying the planet and destroying these ancient rainforests and, you know, oh, we're going to ruin the world and the sky is falling is, I think, baloney. And there are a lot of environmentalists that are probably very sincere, very intelligent, and very wrong. And they're fighting the wrong battle. Now, it's true, people abuse the environment, and when somebody's dumping chemicals upstream from my house, you know, I'm going to sue them and say, don't dump that in my water supply, okay? That's fine. But if there's an environmental problem, is the government the one to fix it? Show me anything they fixed. If they fix it, it'll cost ten times more than it should, and probably still won't be right. I do believe in global warming, though. The Bible says in Revelation 16, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the power was given to him to scorch men with fire. There's going to be global warming. Hasn't happened yet. Coming soon to a city near you. A question I get by atheists sometimes when I do debates, and I've done uh, 99 professors I've debated now, they'll say, well, doesn't the Green River Formation in Wyoming prove the earth is millions of years old? There's a good article in one of the old creation magazines. I recommend the magazine. I disagree with a couple things on them, but, you know, disagree with everybody on something except me. But it's really good from uh, uh, Australia. They've got a good article about the Green River Formation, if you want to read that. There, uh, go to answersingenesis.org. You can get their uh, website. I get their, or, or the magazine, about 22 bucks a year, I think. The Green River Formation is a layer of rock in Wyoming that contains possibly hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of finely stratified layers. Well, if you go to our museum, you can get that little glass thing with two pieces of glass and different colored sand in between. You flip it over and it makes dozens and dozens of layers in a matter of a few seconds. Well, when they dig through the Green River, they'll say, here's a picture of the Green River formation. They'll say, oh, each of these layers is a different season. And they go by the pollen. They say some have, there's certain pollen produced by trees in the spring. A different kind of tree produces pollen in the fall. And if you look at these layers, it's got the spring, fall, spring, fall, spring, fall. I mean, like maybe even a million times. And they call them annual layers because of the pollen. Well, the truth of the matter is, all those things would sort very rapidly, just like the thing in our museum does, sorts things very rapidly. Multiple, there's only two densities of sa colored sand in there, black and white, but it'll make, you know, 40 layers in a few seconds. Multiple layering, ma massive layering forms quickly. If you dig through this Green River formation, you find layers of ash in there from apparently a volcanic eruption. As they drill down through the ash, they count the number of layers between the two ash layers, the number of layers of Green River formation. And it's up to 35% difference in two different places. You drill one hole, you got 100 layers. You drill another hole, you only got, you know, 60 layers. What's, why would that be? You know, if those layers are really annual rings, then they should be consistent throughout the whole thing, and it's simply not. So get the article in Creation Magazine if somebody ever says to you the Green River formation proves the Earth is millions of years old. It does not. And I get asked the question, maybe you've heard the question, what about the Mars rock? Is there really life on Mars? Like this article, you know, are we really Martians? There was a video a program when I was a kid called My Favorite Martian. It was kind of like Bewitched in one of those programs, you know. And the idea that there's been life on Mars has been around for, for decades. Here's a, uh, Percival Lowell's picture here. 
showing him thinking about, boy, he said that Mars seems to be inhabited is not the last but the first word on the subject back a hundred years ago. He said there might be life on Mars because of the canals. Well, the Mars rover went up there. They sent, I think, uh, I don't know how many have gone up there. Quite a few failed, you know, good proof against evolution. But <laughs> then this machine, that multi-billion dollar machine, lands on Mars, tests the soil. Could not even find a trace of a germ on Mars. Now, Walt Brown says in his book, in the beginning, if there's anything found on Mars, and there may be bacteria found on Mars, he says, he predicted that, it came from Earth during the flood when the fountains of the deep broke open. He says, the, he does all the physics and he's a physics professor, he said there would be enough pressure of 10 miles of rock pushing down on water to shoot things into orbit from Earth. That would then float around for you know, a few hundred, few thousand years until they happen to get caught in a gravitational pull of whatever. And he thinks there might be stuff on Mars and it would have come from planet Earth. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a pretty convincing argument he makes for it. But there have been two, 35 missions to Mars. Two-thirds were complete or partial failures. Lots of money we spent trying to prove life on Mars. What's the purpose? Well, <clears throat> I think the whole purpose of the space program anymore is to prove evolution. They're trying desperately to prove God didn't do it. And if they can find life someplace else, well then that's proof, you know, for evolution in their mind. This little rock you see a picture of here, sample ALH 8401.0. This was the rock that they said proved there was life on Mars. Now this rock was actually found near the South Pole. On that rock, there's a little wiggly line right there in the red circle. That little line, they said, looks like a fossilized bacteria. This is under a microscope, extremely highly magnified. And they said, see, that's proof there's life on Mars because here's a fossilized bacteria. Well, first place, Mars is quite a ways from the Earth, okay? I mean, quite a ways from the Earth. The closest they ever get in their orbits is about uh, one half astronomical unit, or about 45 million miles. That's the closest it ever gets. If we shrank all the planets down to the size of tomatoes, and Earth was a four-inch tomato, Mars would be a two-inch tomato. It's about half the diameter of Earth. And the closest it ever gets in its orbit would be about a third of a mile away at that scale. They say something hit Mars and knocked that rock over to Earth. Think about it. I want you to shoot a two-inch tomato so that a piece of it splatters a third of a mile and lands on a four-inch tomato. I think you're asking for, obviously there should be some evidence of something hitting Mars that hard, like maybe a dent, you know. <laughs> there ought to be something to indicate that got blasted that hard to shoot something that far. But I don't buy the Mars rock at all. Well, basically what happened, that NASA was trying desperately to get their grant money through Congress. Congress was not about to vote for 20 bazillion more dollars for NASA to go look for, you know, life on Mars. They claim the rock came from Mars. They claim it broke off 16 million years ago, drifted around through space, and finally landed 13,000 years ago near the South Pole. That's the claim, okay? The truth of the matter is it was in a closet in NASA for about seven years, this rock was. My questions would be, what did this bacteria eat for these, you know, 16 million years while it's flying around through space? Uh, how did it survive the impact of the initial thing blasting it out, this vacuum of space, the re-entry? It's going to burn up coming through. It's going to remelt the whole rock coming through our atmosphere. It's going to melt the whole thing. Freezing for 13 years near the South Pole. It was a NASA-funded team that did the research on the rock, and at the same time, NASA grant money was stalled in Congress. So what really was happening was they said, guys, you've got to find something important in this rock so that we can tell the people we've got to have more grant money. And Jonathan, when we did the radio program, oftentimes we'd read these articles about these, you know, this, the hidden agenda was always send more money for more research. You know, if only we had more money, we could do it in just about every article in these science magazines. As soon as the announcement was made about the Mars rock, the grant money was released. Congress voted, yes, let's give NASA 40 bazillion dollars, okay? A few, months, a few months later, they studied the rock more and said, oh, that's not, that's not a bacteria. That's actually a crystal, a carbonate crystal, a naturally forming substance. Okay, we're sorry, folks. We'll keep looking, but thanks for the grant money. You know, they didn't, of course, they didn't return it after that. It's just a, simply a carbonate crystal that forms naturally on rocks. The Bible says Eve's the mother of all living. I do not believe there's life on other planets. There is no evidence at all of any life on any other planet except right here on Earth. The question that frequently comes up is, what about theistic evolution? Couldn't God use evolution? Well, of course, that depends on what you mean by God. Okay. Osama bin Laden believes in God. He's certainly got a different God than I do. Okay. The Mormons believe in God. When they say our Heavenly Father, they're praying to Adam. 
We'll get into more Mormons in a minute. So what do you mean by God? The God that would use a process like evolution would be cruel, wasteful, and retarded. It is not the God of the Bible, that's for sure. It's not in the character of God to use an evil, mean process like evolution where bazillions of animals have to die in order for this things to improve. God is merciful. Evolution is cruel. It's not merciful. The weakest is destroyed in evolution, not protected. Jacques Monod, a Nobel Prize winner, said, Natural selection is the blindest and most cruel way of evolving new species and more complex organisms. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is non-selective where the weak is protected, which is the opposite of the so-called natural law. He said, I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God set up to have evolution. I'm surprised, too, that anybody would say God used evolution. What kind of God do they have, anyway? He's mean, that's for sure. Um, philosopher David Hull said, Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be, He is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of Galapagos is careless. Uh, he is wasteful, he's indifferent, he's almost diabolical. So this is not the God of the Bible, and I would have to agree. Charles Darwin in his book said, uh, From the war of nature, from famine, from death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals follows. See, in evolution, billions of things have to die in order to make the process work. One animal evolves a little better than the rest, the rest of them have to die, or the new improved genes are swamped back into the gene code. They're lost. But there are people who teach, you know, theistic evolution. The Bible says God's way is perfect. He made it right the first time. So I do not believe God would use evolution to get us here for several reasons. I think they're talking about a different God, okay? This is not the character of the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible doesn't do things that way, okay? The Bible says He made everything by His Word and it was perfect. He made it all in six days. The Bible's real clear and He rested on the seventh day. And He finished His works from the foundation of the world. So the Bible clearly teaches six days of creation rested the seventh day. Over and over it calls it the seventh day. And the Bible says real clearly that man brought death into the world. If theistic evolution is true, then death brought man into the world. Or death was here before man arrived. And the Bible says clearly man brought death into the world. And the Bible says we're made in God's image. So if the original created man was some kind of you know, animal that slowly evolved, then what does God look like? You know, is he a baboon? The fourth thing to consider, I think it's a retarded God that can't make it right first time. He's not worthy of worship, that's for sure. And it certainly, number four, nullifies the need for the death of Christ. And fifthly, and most importantly probably, there's no evidence for evolution anyway. So why should we take a perfectly good Bible, which has never been proven wrong, and compromise it with a stupid theory that's never been proven right? Everything about evolution is backwards to the Bible. Every single thing. Nothing matches. You can look at the chart there and see everything's backwards. The Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. The Bible says God created man. Evolution says man created God. Does evolution match the Bible? Absolutely not. It is a heresy to teach God used evolution. And a heresy is something against the clear teaching of Scripture. And I think there are people who are heretics today. I debated Hugh Ross, uh, Reasons to Believe. He's written several books. I've got uh, several of them right here. Creator in the Cosmos, Creation in Time, The Genesis Solution, uh, Creation in Time. He is a very nice man, a very smart man, and probably sincere, and probably really honestly loves the Lord in his own way. I do think he has a different God than I do, and I suspect that he's probably not a Christian in the biblical sense. He's got a mental acceptance of Christ, but not repentance and faith. That's just my theory. These four things right here, uh, ham, chicken, ribs, turkey, what do they all have in common? Well, they're all meats, they're all edible, and they all have bones in them. You have to learn early in life to eat the meat and spit out the bones, or you're going to choke on something, okay? That's just the way life is. If you don't learn that as a kid, you're going to die pretty early. And there are some good things you can learn, from, even from the heretics. They teach things that got some really good teaching in there. But you better spit out the bones. When I debated Hugh Ross, I asked him all kinds of questions, and we've got the whole thing. Uh, John Ankerberg show taped it for us. And John Ankerberg now is a believer that the earth is billions of years old. And he's a friend of mine, nice guy, but I think that is pure heresy to teach that. In his book, Genesis Solution, right here, here's his testimony. 
He was a teenager reading through the Bible. He said, 18 months later, I arrived at Revelation 22. In other words, I finished the Bible. During those, 18, no, during those months, I read every passage and failed to discover anything I could honestly label as an error or contradiction. Some parts I had trouble understanding, but that didn't bother me. I understood enough, just as I understood enough physics and astronomy to trust what I was learning in my university courses. He was studying astronomy, and he became an astronomer in Canada, okay? PhD in astronomy. Now, at the bottom, he says, With some more delays and a little more wrestling with personal pride, I did make a transfer of trust, inviting God, the creator of the vast cosmos, to be my God, the master of my destiny, through Jesus Christ, his Son. Now, does that mean he got saved? I don't know. It looks to me, from what he still believes, that he has a mental acceptance of Christ. He is like, I would consider, a Catholic bishop or a pope, who probably very sincere, very dedicated, and just simply doesn't understand repentance and faith. This is more of a mental acceptance rather than a uh, real salvation experience, I think. I hope I'm wrong. I don't know who's going to heaven and who's not. I'm not saying he's going to hell. But I suspect he's not a Christian in the biblical sense, okay? I have a whole series. I debated Hugh Ross for three hours, and then we made a bunch of post-debate comments, and that's all available on our video series about the Hugh Ross debate. There's a great book by Jonathan Sarfati about Hugh Ross's heresies. Now, Sarfati's a brilliant guy. He lives in Australia, and I love reading his stuff. I think he's wrong on a couple things, you know. Certainly, his thinking about the King James is wrong, but we can deal with that some other time. It's, it's possible to believe in God and still not be saved. James 2.19 says the devils believe and tremble. They believe. They're not saved. They have a head knowledge, but not a heart knowledge. Uh, Matthew 7, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Not everybody who claims they're a Christian really is. Okay. What about some of the other religions? I think theistic evolution probably would be a false religion as opposed to a branch of Christianity. But there are quite a few other religions. I'm going to cover a lot of this in our college class, so I'm going to skip most things for now. I won't cover them all now, just to hit a few highlights. But in our college class in the 200 series, we will cover a lot of other religions. I mean, there's a lot of religions out there. Who's right? Well, obviously, the independent Baptists are right. You know, when you get done climbing the mountain of truth, that's, you know, fine. That they're sitting there all along. Uh, did you figure that out yet, Derek, that the independent Baptists are the ones that are right? You're, you're not quite there yet. You're still climbing? Still climbing, okay. Uh, so I'm not against other religions. I'm simply for truth and against error. And if the Catholics teach something that is right, I'll say, yay, you're right. If my mother teaches something that is right or wrong, I'll say, yay, that's right, that's wrong. You don't ever want to get committed to a denomination or committed to, a, to any one thing other than truth. So I'm for truth and against error. And the Bible says in Ephesians, you've got to be careful about being carried away with every wind of doctrine. When religions differ on things, if somebody must be wrong. Of course, maybe they're both wrong. But at least one of them has to be wrong, okay, if there's a difference. So, he that cometh first in his own cause seemeth just, it says in Proverbs. And a young person, the first time they hear somebody talk about a religion, they say, oh, wow, that sounds good. Well, you better search it out. I remember the first time I heard the teachings of uh, the Jehovah's Witness. As he, I was a brand new Christian. I got reading some of their stuff. I said, wow, that seems right. Until I studied it. Wow, that's not right. So, and that's the danger. of Any young person can be trapped because the first time you hear something, oh, wow, that sounds good. You better really search it out. We had uh, here on staff, one of the guys had a book that he was giving out, you know, to everybody. And it sounded really good. But it was written by some of the heretics of the first century. I said, well, you better really study this out. It seems right at first until you say, oh, wait a minute, is that true? Uh, it's interesting, if you read Genesis 27, Jacob and Esau, you know, how Jacob tricked his father. The father went by the feeling instead of by the word. He said, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. So he gave him Esau's blessing. And it's, the reason he got tricked is precisely because he went by the feeling. The Mormons will tell you they know they're right because when they prayed about Mormonism, they got a burning in the bosom. They got a feeling, of, oh, wow, this feels right. Well, just kneeling down and praying to anything will give you that burning feeling. Oh, and just a reverence of kneeling down praying to this rock. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's right, okay? And that's their whole thinking. It's all based on feeling. A lot of the charismatics do the same stuff. You know, they have this feeling like, oh, wow, I just feel like I should, you know, do this. We got the demonstration in the science center about the, you blindfold the person on the chair that spins. Any of you ever done that thing? Sit down there, get blindfolded, spin you around. Within 30 seconds, you feel like you're not spinning even though you still are. And then when you stop the person, they feel like they're turning the other way, even though they're not turning at all. And that's how pilots crash their planes, because they go by their feelings and not by what does the gauge say. So, I am not anti any other religion. 
I'm simply for truth and for the Bible and against error. So keep that in mind. And you've got to be careful about going on feelings. What about the Sabbath? Well, I get asked probably every week. I get books sent to me. I've got a whole section of our library by probably every book ever written by any Seventh-day Adventist, and they're all trying to convert me over to being a Seventh-day Adventist. And they send me all kinds of stuff, and don't send me any more. I've already got them all, okay? I don't need any more. I've got lots of books, all the books by Ellen G. White, E.G. White, okay, who wrote, and she was the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm not anti-Seventh-day Adventist. I've spoke, spoken at some of their churches. And there's a lot of good folks, love the Lord, genuinely saved, going to heaven as much as I am. But what is the truth about the Sabbath? Are we supposed to, you know, work on the seventh, rest on the seventh day? Is that the day of worship or the day of rest? Or what is the truth about the Sabbath? Well, Nehemiah chapter 9, uh, it says, Thou camest down upon Mount Sinai, and spakest uh, with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, true laws, good statutes, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath. Wait a minute, this is Nehemiah talking about the time Moses received the Sabbath from God. That's 2,500 years after the creation. See, I don't have Moses even on that chart, but 2,500 years after the creation, God made the Sabbath known to Moses. You mean for 2,500 years, for more than a third of human history, nobody kept this? Apparently so. He revealed it to Moses. He said in Exodus 16, See that the Lord hath given you the seventh day, every man abide in his place. Don't go out of your house on the Sabbath day. Well, if that's really one of the laws for the Sabbath, then you can't have a seventh day church that meets someplace because everybody's going out of their house to get there. All right? You talk about a Sabbath day's journey in Acts chapter 1. Jesus traveled on the Sabbath, okay? What's he doing out of his house? The Bible says, Remember the Sabbath, in it thou shalt not do any work. Don't you do it, nor your son, nor your maidservant, nor the stranger. Not only can you not work, you can't make anybody else work. Which means if you really want to honor and obey the Sabbath, according to Scripture, you cannot work and you can't make anybody else work, which means you cannot use any utilities. Because if you're using the city water, the city lights, the city gas, you're making somebody work. If you're watching TV, you're making somebody work on the Sabbath. If you go out to eat, you're making somebody work. You can't do that. So, he rested the seventh day. The Bible says if they worked on the seventh day, Exodus 31, they'd be put to death. So, you've got to kill people that work on the Sabbath. It's punishable by death. Exodus 31 is a key passage on this. The Lord said unto Moses, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, My Sabbaths ye shall keep. It is a sign between me and you. The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. I mean, it's right there, Exodus 31. It's pretty clear. The Sabbath was for the children of Israel. I'm Norwegian. Sabbath, God made some strange rules for the children of Israel because they were to be a peculiar people. People were to look at them and say, wow, that's strange. What's different about you guys? And they were to be a testimony to the world. But he didn't command all the world to keep this. He said, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. It's pretty clear in Exodus 31. Exodus 35 says, You shall need, kindle no fire, which means you couldn't start your car. Don't they run on internal combustion? You know, you're starting a fire. So if you really want to keep the Sabbath, you can enjoy yourself. I've never met anybody, anybody who keeps the Sabbath. Never met one person. Okay? The elders of Israel, he said in Ezekiel 28, he says, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them. The Sabbath is for the children of Israel. Again, it tells us in Ezekiel chapter 20. Jesus was on the Sabbath day going through the corn. He plucked the corn because they were hungry and they ate it. First of all, what's he doing out of his house? And what's he doing working on the Sabbath day? Did he not keep it? The Bible says in Mark chapter 2, uh, the Pharisees said, Why do you do that which on the Sabbath which is not lawful? And he said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. What's he doing out of his house and what's he doing working on the Sabbath? Jesus said in Mark 3, It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day to save life. And they looked about, they got angry at him. For his answer. And people today get angry at me because I don't keep what their idea of the Sabbath is. I say, look, I, I keep every day as holy. I work seven days a week for the Lord. My whole life is soaked up into God's work. I do nothing else. <laughs> this is it. So people say, do you, do you keep the Sabbath? Oh, yeah. And, and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I keep them all. Yeah, I keep them all. Okay. <laughs> do them all. Jesus went outside on the Sabbath. He took his disciples with him. What's he doing? Making them sin. He picked corn. He healed people. He got angry at the hypocrites. He's not resting and being refreshed, that's for sure. He's getting angry at the hypocrites on the Sabbath. So there's a book. I don't know that I can highly recommend it, but I recommend it. If you can read past uh, Peter Ruckman's uh, rude, crude, crass, mean-spirited uh, technique of writing. Adam, you know all about, about that. He's got some brilliant logic in here. It's $2 for the book. We offer it. We don't sell it on the website. We don't advertise it. But if you want more, 
he's got brilliant logic and real abrasive, I think unnecessarily so. But it's good, good logic on why he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. If you want to get that, you can get it. So, I, if you want to keep the Sabbath, you just enjoy yourself. But it's interesting, in Romans 13, he listed some of the commandments. O no man anything but to love one another. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, like the Sabbath, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He didn't list the Sabbath here in Romans 13. The first day of the week, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And I know there's arguments back and forth of which day are we supposed to meet on. I don't care, okay? Most churches meet on Sunday. I don't think they call it a day of worship, though some do. It's the day that they meet. The Sabbath was not designed to be a day of worship. It was designed to be a day of rest. You worship God all seven days. You rest one, that's all. If you want to rest Saturday, that's fine. So the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. It's a New Testament tradition that they met on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, on the first day of the week, let everybody lay by in store, come bring your tithes and offerings in. Uh, that's when most churches meet, okay? Let no man judge you in meat or drink or holy days or the Sabbath. Don't let anybody tell you you're wrong on that. Okay, people say, well, didn't the Pope accept evolution? Yes, they have several times. The Popes have accepted evolution and many people have gotten upset. There have been at least three or four, I think, articles about the Popes have accepted evolution as a fact. This uh, Catholic nun said, people who believe this creation myth, which is unscientific and not in the Bible, despite what they say, haven't really studied theology. I don't know how a nun can be that dumb. If you don't think the creation story is in the Bible, <laughs> what is she reading? Okay. By the way, you want to do some interesting study. Read the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, and then go to any Catholic church and say, hey, do you guys have the Ten Commandments? Oh yeah, they'll give you a copy of them. They left out the second one about don't make a graven image. Their Ten Commandments skip commandment number two, and they take commandment number ten and split it into two commandments to make nine and ten. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Which really was one commandment. Why wouldn't they want the real one in there that says don't make a graven image? Because their church is full of graven images, okay? So, back in the uh, 1400s, if you committed certain sins, you could pay money to the priest and be absolved, get your sins forgiven. If you robbed a church, you'd have to pay $2.25. Here's the list of what they had to pay to get out of their sin. If you burn a house, you've got to pay $2.75. If you kill a layman, buck seventy-five. If you forge, forgery or lying, two bucks. If you eat meat in Lent, two seventy-five. If you ravish a, ravish a virgin, two bucks. If you strike a priest, two seventy-five, same as burning a house. Robbery, three bucks. Keeping a priest that keeps a mistress can do so if he pays $2.25. Okay? Procuring an abortion is $1.50. Murder of parents or wife, two fifty. You can be absolved of all crimes by paying twelve bucks. <laughs> That's how, what's the way to describe that? Stupid? Is that the best way to describe that? Okay. I'm not anti-Catholic. Okay. I'm for truth. I'm against error. That is error to say paying money pays for your sins, and it's error to say burning a candle pays for your sins, and it's error to say priest, father, I have sinned. You know. And you, would you please absolve me of my sins? That's error. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin, nothing else. So I'm not anti-Catholic. I'm simply uh, for truth and against error. Keep that thought in mind. Here's a picture of the Pope kissing the Koran. The Catholic Catechism in our library out here, you can read it for yourself. Some of the things they believe are pretty interesting. They say in the Catholic Catechism, uh, 841, the church's relationship with the Muslims is the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator, the first place among whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us they adore the one merciful God. There's an excellent little bitty comic book called The Prophet you can get from our ministry. It's like $2 or something like that uh, by Jack Chick. He goes through the history of the Muslim church and how they started. Very few people realize it was the Catholics that started Islam. They started the whole religion purposely to try to get the Holy Land back for the Catholics. They built up the Islam, <clears throat> they, they funded Muhammad, they trained him, they sent a Catholic nun out of the monastery. They said, we want you to come out of your co convent, go find a young promising uh, Muslim, marry him, and train him to raise up an army of Arabs to go take back the Holy Land for the Mother Church. Quite an interesting story if you want to read about that. It, it started to work, but then it failed because the Islam got so big, they said, well, forget you Catholics, we're doing what we want. And I don't think most Muslims, which is now, what, 
10, 20 percent of the world population Islam, I don't think most of them know that they really started off as a front for the Catholic Church. So let's cover just a little bit on Muslims. Ask the Muslim, how do you know Muhammad was a prophet? They'll say, well, he had a mole on his back. Holy moly. That's, that's how you know he's a prophet, because he's got a mole on his back. I've got a mole on my back. Got one right here on my cheek. Man, I must be a double prophet. Got two moles. Albert, you got any moles? Yeah. You, well, wow, bow down and worship Albert, you know. In uh, one of the Muslim verses says, uh, <clears throat> Muhammad asks the question, When I am dead and buried in the ground and go back to dust, is that all? What will happen to me? Muhammad himself had no clue if he was going to heaven. This uh, verse in, in the Quran says, When he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a pond of murky water. Would that be scientifically accurate to say the sun sets in a pond of murky water? No. I would say this, the earth turns around and the sun, you know, appears to go around the earth. This is not scientifically accurate. The Koran has loads of scientific errors. It's not a holy book. Allah commands any person who leaves Islam <coughs> or encourages others to do so should be seized and slain. There are over 100 commands in the Koran to kill people who won't convert. Anybody that won't convert has to be killed. And I see Bush and these guys saying, you know, we're trying to bring democracy in Iraq. The problem with Iraq is their religion. They are being taught every couple days in the synagogue, you've got to kill anybody who won't convert. <clears throat> and there probably are millions of Muslims who don't like this and they don't want to do that, but they just, in order to be a good Muslim, you have to kill anybody else who will, won't become Muslim. That's the rules, okay? Islam is a religion where God requires you to send your son to die for him. The Bible is where God sent His Son to die for you. <laughs> exactly the opposite, okay? If you study the history of Jerusalem and the problems with Islam, it's phenomenal. Keep in mind, they both come from the two sons of Abraham. Abraham, if he wouldn't have gone down into Egypt and got that Egyptian girl and had that one baby Ishmael, we wouldn't have this whole problem because all the Arabs come from Ishmael. And the price of gas would not be over two bucks a gallon if it hadn't been for Abraham and Hagar, okay? <laughs> Probably more if the Jews had control of all of it. They like money too. But the Romans and Byzantines, you know, trampled uh, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Chuck Missler's got all kinds of stuff on the uh, Jerusalem and the, the problems they've had with Islam over the years. It's been trampled down by the Gentiles. The Bible says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people. And we've got a ton of stuff in our college class CSE 200 series about Islam. One of the books we sell in our bookstore, and I don't get off into every single religion there is, but Islam is a growing, powerful religion, and you need to study it, is this little booklet, Who is This Allah? On page 27, he says, The last hour will not come before the Muslims fight the Jews and the Muslims kill them. That's their plan. Uh, the purest joy in Islam is to kill and be killed for Allah. After killing tens of thousands of non-Muslims in Iran, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini said, In Persia, no people have been killed so far, only beasts. Because he thought they're not Muslim, so they're not really people. Uh, Allah created Adam, making him 60 cubits tall, according to Bahara, volume 4. That's 90 foot tall. I mean, is that, you believe that? Adam was 90 feet tall? In the third serve, verse 105, it says, In the great and final redemption, only white faces shall be saved, all black faces will be condemned. In other words, you've got to be white to go to heaven, to the Muslim heaven. Okay? In the fourth serve, it says, Mary, Men, marry as many women as you like, one, two, three, or four. In Islam, they tell the people you can have four wives, but only four. So what they'll do is they'll get three wives, and then the fourth one, they have what they call uh, convenience marriages. You can marry somebody for 15 minutes and then divorce them. So you can have all the concubines you want. Oh, I was only married 15 minutes. There's no law against that. That's their law that says you can do that. In uh, volume 1, it says, uh, Abu reported, When any of you wakes from sleep, he performs ablution. He must cleanse his nose, clean his nose three times. For the devil spends the night in the interior of the nose. Good Muslims will get up in the morning, suck water into their nose, and blow it back out three times. That's got to hurt. Why? Well, because the devil lives in your nose. While you're sleeping, the devil crawls in. That's what they teach. Okay? Uh, Bakara, volume 4, says that Satan stays in the upper part of the nose all night. Well, guess what expression we get from that? The boogeyman. Right? 
uh, the booger man. Allah report, or Abdu reported, the Apostle Allah said, People should avoid lifting their eyes toward the sky while supplicating in prayer. Otherwise, their eyes would be snatched away. If you're praying and you look up, your eyes will be popped out of your head. He reported, uh, Muslims, non-Muslims eat in seven intestines while a Muslim eats in one. Is there a biological difference between non-Muslims and Muslims? Do non-Muslims have seven intestines? You studied anatomy. Adam, is that in there? They've pretty much the same. If you do an autopsy, I bet you'd find they're the same. Uh, Don Boys, my friend up in Chattanooga, Tennessee area, has written a great book called Islam, America's Trojan Horse. His website's fabulous too, CST, for Common Sense Today, news.com. You can read about, uh, more about Islam. He's, got a lot of, he's really re received some flack for even writing the book. Okay? What about Mormons? What do they believe? Are they a Christian religion? Joseph Smith said, I see no faults in the church, and therefore let me be resurrected with the saints. Whether I ascend to heaven or descend to hell or go to any other place, if we go to hell, we will turn the devils out of doors and make a heaven out of it. When this pe where this people are, there is good society. What do we care where we are if the society be good? Joseph Smith didn't know if he was going to heaven or hell, by the way. God made Aaron to be a mouthpiece to the children of Israel, and he will make me be God to you in his stead. If you don't like it, you must lump it. <laughs> That's what Joseph Smith said. Joseph Smith said, There are men living on the moon who dress like Quakers and live to be nearly a thousand years old. Well, we've been to the moon a bunch of times now. Are there Quakers up there? This is scientifically inaccurate. Okay, He's wrong. Uh, official Mormon doctrine is someday we get to become God. The Mormons teach, as, as we are, Adam or God once was, God used to be a man. And as God is, we shall be. And they think Adam became God. So when they pray, Heavenly Father, they're praying to Adam. There's some good books we offer here you can get on Mormonism. The Secret History of the Mormon Church is excellent. This shows some of the history of how people have been killed trying to leave Mormonism. Because if you start speaking out against Mormonism or try to leave the religion, I mean in the old days especially, you'd get killed. They'd just find you dead someplace in the middle of the you know, desert. If you want to read more on that, Mormonism, a way that seemeth right, is also good. It's nothing but questions for Mormons. There's one we offer by Thomas Hines, uh, Answers to My Mormon Friends, if you want to read up on that. There's a good book, the red one, Mormonism, Mama and Me. This is the more gentle approach. It's uh, just a grandma type, hey, honey, you know, do you really believe that? Now, why is that? It's kind of a, a softer, gentler approach to reaching Mormons, if you want to. The ultimate authority on Mormons that I have seen is uh, Gerald and Sandra Tanner in Utah, Salt Lake City, utlm.org, Utah Lighthouse Mission. This is real fine print of everything you ever wanted to know and a whole lot more <laughs> on Mormonism. It is phenomenal, the stuff that the Mormons believe. Joseph Smith forged the book. Somebody else had taken a book to the printer to get printed. It was a, a Baptist who got mad at his church, and he wrote a story about, it was a novel actually, well, Joseph Smith apparently got that, the draft copy. We have on CD available here, if you want to get it, the actual photocopies of the pages that he took to the printer and said, this is what I want printed. Supposed to be the most perfect book on earth. He said he got these special seer stones that he would put these golden plates that he got from the angel Moroni. He put them in a hat. He'd look in there with the seer stone, and he had a curtain beside him, and he would read to his friend, Hiram, I believe it was, who, who wrote down everything. When he got done writing all this through the curtain, Hiram never got to see the golden, nobody ever got to see the golden plates. Nobody, except Joseph. He told people about it, okay? There were no golden plates. But he said he translated it through this special seer stone because it was written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was, he's reading the text of this book that he stole from the printer, apparently, okay? And when he got all done writing it, they took it to the printer to get printed. They said it's the most perfect book, book ever written. It came straight from God. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of mistakes in it and corrections. If you want to see the actual one, call our office. We'll have the CD available. I got it in my office stack up in Pavel. You can, we can produce those on Mormonism. So I'm not anti-Mormon. I'm for truth and against error, and what they teach is error. We've got a ton of stuff on Mormonism if you want to read it. Uh, Lucy Max Smith said, Joseph uh, was running through the woods at the top of his speed for three miles with the gold plates tucked under his arm. 
and three people came out and he had to knock three different people down. While he's running with these plates, full blast, with the plates under his arm, golden plates, three people attacked him. He knocked him down with one hand and kept running to the house. The size of the golden plates, this is a picture of what they would have been, this is one that uh, the tanners have in their museum, of the golden plates of the size that Joseph Smith said they were. This is out of lead. Now gold is a lot heavier than lead. The golden plates, that size, the dimensions were given several times, and in in Joseph Smith told them how wide they were, etc. They would weigh 230 pounds. Paul, you lift weights a lot. Can you run with 230 pounds under one arm? No. They have competition in New York every year. I forget what they call it, but they bring all the bodybuilders and huge muscle guys in and say, let's see who can run three miles carrying these plates under their arm. They got a huge prize for anybody who can do it. The farthest anybody's made it with under one arm is 75 feet. That's walking, carrying 230 pounds under one arm. Good luck, okay? I don't buy that story that Joseph Smith told. I think he's lying, okay? Questions. Why did Joseph Smith try to join the Methodist Church in 1828, when in 1820 the Lord told him all of the churches were wrong and they were an abomination? Why? Just questions. The book uh, Mormonism, A Way That Seemeth Right, is mostly just questions. It's here, in the, here we go. Now, I would differ with these guys on several things, okay? I, I'm not promoting everything they believe, but this book is well done. It's just simply questions to ask Mormons. Like, why does your one book say you have to have more than one wife to be saved, and your other book says if you have more than one wife, you're damned? Which is it? You know, just obvious contradictions in the Mormon religion. And again, I'm not anti-Mormon. I'm for truth and against error. Why weren't the three witnesses in the book, to the Book of Mormon taken to Joseph Smith's house and show him the golden plates? Why did he only take them to the woods and they saw the plates in a vision? Nobody ever saw those golden plates. The Book of Mormon says the final battle between the Nephites and Lamanites was on the hill Camara in New York. Well, there had been nothing ever found there. No evidence at all found of a battle where millions died. There are a couple of great DVDs out now called The Bible versus the Book of Mormon and uh, DNA versus the Book of Mormon. Did you get to see either of those, Jonathan? No, oh, they're, they're in the library if you want to check those out. Okay? According to the claims of Mormon, the Lord led three groups of people from, to America from the Middle East. Uh, the Jaredites, the Nephites, and the Molochites. There's no evidence of any of these ever been found. Nothing. There is no archaeological evidence to back up the Book of Mormon. So if you want to study Mormonism, I'd recommend those two DVDs that just came out in 2005 about the serious problems with the Book of Mormon. And again, there are millions, I think like 10 million people now follow Mormonism. Some very good, sincere, honest, intelligent people who have just been absolutely duped, deceived, tricked, lied to. Why would Joseph Smith admonish his people not to drink wine or strong drink and then attempt to construct a bar in the Mason house, mansion house and only reneged when his wife Emma declared, either that bar goes or I go? Why is he doing that? Bruce McConkie said, Thus the names, titles of signify our Lord is the only Son of the Father in the flesh. Christ was begotten by an immortal, immortal Father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers. Is that correct? Was Christ the physical son? Or, uh, this is heresy, okay? He was born in the same personal, real, and literal sense that any mortal son is born to a mortal father. That's what the Mormons teach. Now remember, from the time forth and, this time forth and forever, Jesus Christ was not begotten by the Holy Ghost, it says in the book, Journal of Discourses. Mormonism is not a Christian religion. They, it's a cult in every sense of the word. There are all kinds of errors in what they teach. We'll cover more on that in our college class. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, we could spend two days on Jehovah's Witnesses. I just recommend you get the book, Answers to My Jehovah's Witness Friends. There are other ministries that deal just with that. There's a good little pamphlet you can get, 15 Reasons Why I'm Not a Jehovah's Witness. Here's the address on the screen. You can get mcgregorministries.org. There are people who have taken, you know, God has led it on, on their heart to, you know, witness to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they, they're very sincere, really duped. One of the craziest religions on the planet has got to be Jehovah's Witness. As I go speak on creation and evolution, and especially when I do debates, there's always somebody during Q&A time at the university that says, there are contradictions in the Bible. As a brand new Christian, age 16, I went to the Methodist church camp one more time because I'd been going to the Baptist church, but at the Methodist church camp where I had been going before, the counselor sat us boys down on the bed 
and said, hey, hey guys, who are you? you know, how old are you? Where do you live? Etc. And we told him our names. We're all sitting around in the bunks there. And he said, well, my name is, whatever it was, George or something. He said, I'm a student at University of Illinois, and I want you to know I'm a humanist. Well, I didn't know what a humanist was, so I said, does that mean you believe in humans? He said, well, I do believe in humans, but no, that's not what that means. He said, uh, I said, well, do you believe the Bible? He said, well, the Bible's a good book, but it has lots of errors. Now, I had only been saved for a few months. But I was smart enough to know, because my preacher told me, if anybody ever says the Bible's full of errors, hand them your Bible and say, show me one. So I handed him my Bible and says, well, show me one. He said, I'll be glad to. Here's what he showed me. Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says pretty clearly in chapter 1, The earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed and fruit trees. This happened on the third day. The counselor said, Kent, when did God make the trees? I said, day 3. He said, all right. Verse 20. Day five, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth. He said, Kent, when did God make the birds? I said, day five. He said, what did he make the birds out of? I said, well, it looks like he made them out of the water. Correct. You know, he made Adam out of the dirt, made Eve out of a rib, made the birds out of the water. That's what it says, okay? Verse 24, let the earth bring forth the living creature. He said, now Kent, what did God make the creatures out of? I said, he made them out of the earth, he made the birds out of the water, made the animals out of the dirt. And then he made man. He said, that's chapter 1. Now look at chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And the Lord God made grow every tree. He said, wait, wait, wait. I thought the trees were made on day 3, and man on day 6. Here we have the man made and then the trees after man, which is correct. Were the trees made before man or after man? Have you ever been in an argument with somebody and you, you knew you're losing? You've been, you married guys know about that. You just know, you know, I'm losing this argument. Okay, you might as well stop right now, all right? You might as well just quit. Verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meat for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Oh, here we got two problems. You got the animals made after man, and you got the birds made after man, and the birds are made out of the ground instead of out of the water. He said, Kent, the Bible's a good book, but it's got lots of contradictions. Just in the first two chapters, did the chapter one say the grass plants trees made on day three? Chapter two has plants and trees made after man on day six. Chapter one has birds made out of the water on day five. Chapter two has birds made out of the ground on day six. Chapter one has animals made before man. Chapter two has animals made after man. He said, the Bible's a good book, but it's not God's Word. I'd only been saved a couple of months, and I was crushed in my faith. It seems to happen to every young Christian. Satan sends somebody along to destroy their faith and get them derailed. Well, that got me, I'll tell you what. The rest of that week is camp, at camp, I was a defeated young Christian. Well, I wish I could find that guy today. I can answer his question now, okay? Here's what happened. On the third day, God made the plants, okay, grass, plants, trees. On the fifth day, He made the birds out of the water. On the sixth day, He made the animals, and then He made man, and then He made the garden and put the man in the garden. Now, all of chapter 2 is describing what happened in the garden only. It's not describing the whole world. God made more trees, and it's only the two kinds, the trees that are good for food and the trees that are good to the sight. Beautiful garden. The rest of the world's already full of trees. He's describing what happened in the garden. And then he made one more of each animal so that Adam could name them and select a wife. And so while Adam's standing there, up out of the ground is coming one more of each animal. Now the rest of the world's already full of animals. This is just for Adam to see God do it and to make a wife and to create a wife, to, to select a wife. Up comes a giraffe. He says, giraffe, no thanks. You know, hippopotamus, no thanks. You know, elephant, no thanks. Hamster, no thanks. You know, one by one, Adam names all the animals and rejects them as a wife. And then the Lord says, Adam, go to sleep, son. I've got a surprise for you, and you wake up. Put Adam to sleep, took one rib, and made the world's first loudspeaker. Uh, I mean, the world's first woman, okay? And uh, so this is only describing what's happening in the garden. Now, it's interesting. If you look at the sequence here, Adam actually saw God create things. Eve never saw that. Suppose God had made Adam last. Satan could walk in and say, Hey, Adam, how do you like this beautiful garden I made? And Adam would have doubts the rest of his life. Boy, who really made this? I don't know. I trust you, God, but I don't know. He there's no way he could know. 
Now, the fact is, Eve never saw God create anything. So who did Satan go to to trick? Eve. The weaker vessel, 1 Timothy says. So, that's what happened. There are no contradictions in the Bible. Chapter 1 and chapter 2 are both fine. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam knew full well what he was doing. When she walked up and handed him that banana or whatever it was, say it's an apple, I don't know, we don't know, it's a fruit, okay? He said, oh, brother, Eve, you blew it. He looked at that and he knew if I don't become sin for her, God's going to have to kill her. I think Adam, knowing full well what he was doing, voluntarily took that fruit, ate it, and said, God, whatever you do to her, you've got to do it to me too. That's what I think. Just like Jesus Christ voluntarily became sin for us so that he could save us and we could become the bride of Christ. That'll preach. Okay, as a young Christian, I was reading my Bible and got, came across 2 Chronicles chapter 4. And it says, Solomon made a great sea of ten cubits from brim to brim, and five cubits the height thereof, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it about. I read that, I set my Bible down on my bed, and I said, Lord, this is wrong. If it's ten cubits across, it's not thirty cubits around. Anybody that studies mathematics knows to find the circumference of a circle, it's diameter times pi 3.14159265. I said, it should not be thirty cubits around, it should be thirty-one point you know, 415, 9 cubits around. Why did he say 30 cubits around? I thought there was an error in the Bible and I was going to quit Christianity. And I read the passage and read it and read it and read it and said, wait a minute, wait, 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 I'm missing something here. Verse 5 says it was a hand breadth thick. That's a lot of brass, that thick. And the brim of it was like the work of the brim of a cup. There are two theories of how to solve this supposed contradiction. One theory says it was 10 cubits outside to outside, not counting the thickness of the brass. Now that'll work. If you take 10 cubits, elbow to fingertip, subtract two hand breadths, and calculate backwards, you'll get a value of pi for the inner circumference of 3.14159. It'll work fine. You can give it a try. The other theory is that it says it had a brim like a cup. The bowl went up and had a brim coming out. So it's 30 cubits around the bowl but 10 cubits across brim to brim, counting the little lip sticking out like most cups are bent out just a little bit. Either theory would probably solve the problem. No, there are no contradictions. So First Kings says, Solomon made this molten sea that held 2,000 baths. A bath is about 8 gallons. Yet Second Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. Well, was it 2,000 baths or 3,000 baths? By the way, 3,000 baths, 24,000 gallons is a small to mid-sized swimming pool. Okay, it's the kind you put in your backyard. That's a 24,000 gallon pool. That's a lot of water or oil or whatever they're going to put in this thing. Well, Second Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. First Kings says it contained 2,000 baths. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not full. It's two-thirds full, okay? It could hold 3,000, but it's only got 2,000 in it. How many horses did Solomon have? This is a contradiction the atheists always bring up. First Kings says Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Second Chronicle says Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Well, which is it? 40,000 or 4,000? Now, we sell on our website the Defender's Bible by Henry Morris. I love Henry Morris and the Defender's Bible. He's a good personal friend of mine and his son, John Morris, good friend of mine. Love what they're doing. In the Defender's Bible, he's got a footnote right here that says this is a copyist error. He says, this number is given as 4,000 in 2 Chronicles. This is best explained as a copyist error. Well, I read that and I wrote a letter to Henry Morris and said, Brother, I love you. I sell your Bible, but I'm going to have to put a disclaimer in the front page. You have a mistake. Actually, quite a few mistakes in your footnotes. And so I have a one-page disclaimer that goes with our Defender's Bible that we sell. They've got to stack up in shipping if you want to read it that says, uh, we love Henry Morris, he's got many good notes in here, but like anything, you've got to eat the meat and spit out the bones. He's wrong about this one. There is not a copyist error. Both of those verses are absolutely fine. Read them carefully. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. Does that tell me how many chariots he had? No. That, tell me how, that tells me how many horses he had for the chariots, right? For Second Chronicles, and Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. Oh, now that's, that's different. Apparently he had stalls for the keep the horses and chariots, and he had other stalls just for the horses for the chariots. 
Well, if they had 40,000 stalls of horses for the chariots, and he had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, they had 10 horses per stall. 10 horses per chariot, I'm sorry. Not a contradiction at all. King James got it exactly correct. 10 horses per chariot. They would never put one horse per chariot. I mean, one arrow takes out the whole tank. They had chariot teams, actually. NIV got it wrong. New American Standard got it right. I collect other Bible versions. I got a bunch of them here. Uh, <clears throat> New Revised Standard got it wrong. How many men did David kill? 700 or 7,000. Well, look at the passages carefully. The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians. First Chronicles. David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. Well, which is it? 700 or 7,000? Read it carefully. Again, Henry Morris has a footnote here that says this is a copyist error. No, I'm sorry, Henry, it is not a copyist error. Both verses are fine. Look at them carefully. If he slew the men of 700 chariots, and he slew 7,000 men which fought in chariots, what does that mean? 10 men per chariot. They had 10 men and 10 horses. They had chariot teams. You go out, you fight for a while, you come back, you swap out. See, the chariot does not get tired. The men and horses get tired. And the chariot is your tank. You don't want to lose that thing. So somebody gets wounded, you know, hurt, bring them back, swap out. They had chariot teams. NIV got it wrong. He killed 700 of their charioteers and 7,000 of their charioteers. There's a clear contradiction. Most of the new Bible versions that I'm aware of have some real serious contradictions built in. I'm not aware of any in the King James. The Bible says in Genesis 10, These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues. So the languages are divided in chapter 10. But you read chapter 11, it says the whole earth was of one language. When I debated Farrell Till, who's the editor of an um, atheist magazine up in Illinois, he said, oh, the Bible's got a contradiction. Chapter 10 says the languages were divided up, and chapter 11 says the whole world's of one language. See, the Bible's wrong. Farrell, chapter 11 is recapping like giving a headline. Suppose you saw the headlines in the paper, 10 children killed in school bus accident. Then you start reading the article, and it says, the bus was driving down Highway 12. You say, wait, I thought, I thought they had a wreck. Yeah, the headline is summarizing the story, and now they're going back and giving the details, okay? Chapter 10 summarizes the story, and chapter 11 is going through and giving some of the details. Not a contradiction. Here's another supposed contradiction. How many died in the plague? Numbers 25 says, those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. When you read the story in 1 Corinthians, it says there fell in one day 3 and 20,000. Well, which is it? 24,000 died in the plague, according to Numbers. Or is it 23,000 died in the plague? Well, again, read it carefully. No contradiction. How many died in the plague? 24,000. How many died in one day? 23,000. Well, 1,000 died the next day from the same plague. It's not a contradiction at all. So we go through in our college class quite a few of the supposed contradictions in the Bible. If you think there are some, you can uh, contact our office on our uh, um, during our radio program. We have all kinds of time. We can take an hour and a half question every day on questions, supposed contradictions in the Bible or questions on creation or evolution.